Next, I'd like to yield to the co-chair of the Constitution Caucus, uh, the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Bishop. Thank you. Um, Tom Nevins, who is actually a social archaeologist, gave an, an interesting discussion about ancient Central America, in which he said in 1521, Cortez led a group of Spanish soldiers to what is today Mexico City. And there he found an Aztec society and an Aztec capital with 15 million inhabitants. Cortez gave a simple instructions to Montezuma II, who was in charge at that time, which was either give us your gold or I'll kill you. For whatever reason, Montezuma gave him the gold and then he proceeded to kill him. In fact, the siege of Mex what is today Mexico City, apparent, uh, approximately a quarter of a million Aztecs died from starvation in that siege, and within two years, the Aztec Empire was totally controlled by the Spanish. A decade later, the Inca civilization had the same thing happen to them, led by Pizarro, who once again said, give us your gold or we'll kill you. They got the gold. They proceeded to kill him. And also, within two years, the Inca civilization was totally dominated by the Spanish, which meant that both the Aztecs and the Incas were a highly centralized government, a highly centralized society, a highly centralized economic system, and because of that, they were easy prey for a smaller but very well-trained and well-organized Spanish army. By the 1680s, the Spanish move into the deserts of New Mexico, where they move against the Apaches. There is two things that are different about the Spanish efforts with the Apaches in New Mexico. Number one, uh, there was no gold to be taken. And number two, the Spanish lost. In fact, for almost two centuries, the, Azte the uh, Apache were able to hold at bay the Spanish. And one of the reasons they were is because the Apache civilization was very decentralized. They had tribal leaders, but as the tribal leader was either captured or killed, they just simply got another tribal leader. With the greatest of all is the one we, we probably mispronounce the name and call it Geronimo. But as Nevin said, this Apache civilization was not loosey-goosey. They had customs, they had traditions, they had a very sophisticated society, but they also were decentralized. I am told that in the Apache language, the word you should simply does not exist. Whereas if we look at the thousands and thousands of pages that produced Obamacare and cap and trade, you find the concept of you should being repeatedly inserted over and over and over again. Which means a centralized society has certain strengths, has certain weaknesses. Its greatest strength is it's the concept of uniformity. Everyone can be coerced into doing the exact same thing at the exact same time. A decentralized society has certain strengths and certain weaknesses. Its greatest strength is creativity, flexibility, and the opportunity of its people to have options in the way they like. Now, I know, Mr. Speaker, you and probably Mr. Sussman are wondering what I am actually doing here. I came into the wrong special order, like what I have to do with the topic at hand. I think it does have to do with the topic at hand. Because the idea at the Constitutional Convention was, do we have a centralized or a decentralized society and government here in this country? And indeed, they tried to separate powers horizontally between the three branches of government, but more significantly and more importantly, vertically between the national and state government as a specific way of trying to make sure that we had a decentralized system of government, one that put a greater emphasis on creativity, on flexibility, and the ability to ensure that our citizens had what they call personal liberty, what I simply say, the options to make choices for themselves in the way they wish to do that. The founding fathers had a great fear of control. That's why they rebelled against the British in the first place. They had a great fear of bureaucracies, and why in the Declaration of Independence they talk about the swarms of officials who were sent here by the British government to devour from us our sustenance. Today, we have in our government a federal government that apparently tries to vacuum up as much power, as much money, as much influence as possible. Our government bureaucracy today in Washington is one that is based on command and control style of leadership, which builds a heavy emphasis on rules. And obeying the rules of procedure is far more important than just coming up with a common sense solution to the problem which happens to be at hand. 
In fact, the one of the questions that we have is, our, have we become, in essence, too big today? Have we become more centralized than decentralized, and does that give some apparent weaknesses to our society and our country that we have today? One of the things that we have to do is try to rethink this entire situation. Tomorrow, members of this House will be inviting legislators from around the country who are back here, and we will have a conference in which state legislators will meet with members of Congress to discuss this very issue of what direction this country will be going in the future, and to recognize very clearly that this is not an issue between the left and the right. The idea of federalism, of balancing powers, of creativity, and a less centralized government is not a Republican or Democrat issue. It's an issue of the direction of this country, because it's about people. It's about whether people actually have options in their life or whether we don't. And when we recognize this, it becomes apparent that the only way to make sense of the situation is to make sure that fewer decisions in Washington are allowed to be directed towards the states and local government and the people, that they get more decisions in their life. As Justice Rehnquist said, surely there can be no more important fundamental Constitution question than that the intention of the framers of the Constitution as to how authority should be allocated between the national and state governments. That's the battle with which we still fight and struggle here. And it's the one in which we cannot afford for the future of this country to lose or to fail. If sometimes um, when I was teaching school, my students didn't quite understand the significance of the fall of the Aztecs or the Incas, yeah, that was an annoyance. But if we as members of Congress fail to recognize the distinction between centralization of power and decentralization power that was the very foundation of this country, that's not an annoyance. That becomes a tragedy. I'm very grateful to uh, the Constitution Caucus, especially Chairman Garrett of, uh, of New Jersey, Mr. Representative Stutzman from Indiana, for your leadership in organizing this. I am proud to join my good friend from Colorado, hopefully my good friend from New Mexico, as long as he does not try and change any of my story about the Apaches. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. But I, this is important. This is one of those key issues. This is one of the quintessential issues that will define where we go, either forward to a brighter future or forward into a less secure and more dangerous future. And I appreciate being, a, being able to be a part of it. I thank